take out your Bible, hope you have one with you this morning, take it out, turn to Psalm 100. Um, given that Thanksgiving was this past week, I want us to celebrate on that theme, that concept and idea of Thanksgiving in our lives, and the importance of that in the lives of a Christian. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving celebration this week, and if you have children at home, uh, sometimes it's an incredible blessing to ask them to say grace at Thanksgiving dinner. That can be an incredible blessing. It can also be, well, a bit of a challenge, a bit of an, an adventure to ask them to say the blessing at Thanksgiving dinner. One mom asked her four-year-old son to say grace at Thanksgiving, and he folded his little hands and he bowed his head, and he began to thank the Lord for every single thing. Every person that was at the table named them all by name. Thank you, Lord, for mommy and for daddy and for, for grandma, for grandpa. He went all around the table, thank the Lord for every single person there. And then for everything that was on the table, thank you, God, for the turkey and for the stuffing and for the cranberry sauce and, and for the pies, even thank the Lord for the Cool Whip, every single thing. And then there was this long, awkward pause. And you know, everybody's kind of starting to peek out a little bit to see, is he done? Is he, is he finished yet? And he's still sitting there like this. And finally, after a minute or so, he leaned over to his mom and he whispered, Mom, if I thank God for the broccoli, won't he know I'm lying? Another mom asked her little daughter to say grace there at the table, and her daughter said, but mom, I, I wouldn't know what to say. And her mom said, well, you know, just say what you've heard mommy say. And so she folded her hands, and she bowed her head, and she said, dear Lord, why did I invite all these people to dinner? <laughs> Sometimes it's a blessing to have the children say grace. Sometimes it adds a little bit of spice, a little bit of adventure to the meal. But a spirit of thanksgiving is an important part of the Christian life. It's not just a holiday. Once, once a year, we, we focus on being thankful. Once a year, we, we think about what we have to be thankful for. It's an important part of the Christian life. That passage that Renee quoted just a moment ago, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're told that thankfulness is something that is God's will for us, to be thankful in all circumstances. This is an, an important thing that he wants in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul said that thankfulness is listed as one of the evidences of a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit that spills out in a, a spirit of thankfulness, a spirit of thanksgiving. Colossians chapter 3, he said that thankfulness or gratitude, it's just a sign of someone who's deep into God's word. And so thanksgiving, thankfulness is not just something that we stop and do and pause one time out of the year. It is an important aspect of the entirety of of Christian life. And so this morning I want us to spend time in this, Psalm 100, a psalm of thanksgiving. And I want us to see how thankfulness just impacts every area of our spiritual life, just how pervasive it is in our lives. And I want us to focus on the areas here in this psalm that he talks about, these three areas that thanksgiving impacts us in an attitude of gratitude. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but that's just how it came out. An attitude of thanksgiving and how that impacts these areas of our spiritual lives. First of all, he points out that a thankful heart is a joyful heart. We've been talking about joy a lot in these last several months. We spent some time, we went through the, the book of Philippians, and there's no doubt as you read through the book of Philippians, the, the theme there is the theme of joy, an important aspect for our lives as believers. Something that we have as we, as we rest in God's presence, that's what joy is. Remember, that's the definition that we were working with. Joy is not happiness, it's not dependent on circumstances, it's that steady aspect of realizing God's presence in our lives, that's joy. And a thankful heart is a joyful heart. This is the way he begins the psalm. He says, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Now, I've mentioned this before, but I think it's something that's worth repeating again. And that is that one of the ways that you can quickly pick up on the theme of a passage is look and see if there are any words that are repeated. That's something that, listen, if, if God inspired his writers to say something once, then that's something that's on the heart and the mind of God, something that he wants us to know. But how much more important is it? Is it if God inspires his writers to say it two or three or several times? It's something he really wants us to notice. That's how we see the theme. Here's a, here's a key idea that God is trying to get across to us. He's, he inspired his writers to say it more than once. 
Notice the repeated word there in verses 1 and 2. It's the word joyfully. It says, he says, shout joyfully in verse 1. Shout for joy if you've got an NIV, or make a joyful noise if you've got a, a King James Bible with you this morning. We usually take that phrase, make a, a joyful noise, right? We, we apply that to people who can't sing, right? So we'll just make a joyful noise. That's what the Bible says. This idea of joy and its connection to thankfulness, that a thankful heart is a joyful heart. All of that begins the way he begins this psalm, the fact that he puts this up front indicates the significance of the idea that if we're going to have a life that is grounded in joy, we have to have a heart that is grounded in thanksgiving. And that word there, it means joy, shout joyfully. It does mean joyfully, but it also means a shout of victory. It's the same word that's used in Joshua chapter 6. You remember there in Joshua chapter 6, you may not know where it comes from, but you know the story, I guarantee that. The children of Israel marching around the, the walls of Jericho. And they're, they're going to march around, and Joshua tells them this. He says, on the seventh day, I'm going to give you a command, and at that point, everyone shout a shout of victory. And you know the story. They do that, and the walls collapse, and that's the same word. It means a, a shout of triumph or a, a shout of victory. Victory is a key aspect of the Christian life. In Christ, we are victorious over the circumstances. He said, I have overcome the world. And no matter what happens, you and I can experience victory in Christ. And he talks about this shout of victory. And many people live their lives in sort of this perpetual state of defeat. You may know people that are like that. And no matter what happens, they focus on the, the problems of yesterday. It's all they can see. It's all they can think about. Or, or the problems of today, the, the negative things that are going on, that's all that stands out in their mind. And they just assume tomorrow is going to be the same way. They live every day in every moment of every day in this perpetual state of defeat, this perpetual state of victimhood. I worked with a guy that was like that one time. His name was Keith. Not just Keith. His name, his name was Keith. And no matter what we were doing, no matter what program we were talking about or what process we were talking about or what we were going to do or what plans we were making, this was Keith's signature phrase. Well, the problem with that is, and it didn't matter what was going on, that's how Keith saw life. He only could see what was wrong. He could only see where that train could come off the tracks. He could only see the bad thing. He lived in this perpetual state of defeat. And many people live that way. The sad reality is when believers live that way. Given the victory that Christ has secured for us over death, over sin, over the, the worst things that this world can throw at us, and Christ has secured the victory for us over those things. It's especially sad when believers live a life that is defeated and not a life of victory. And many be begin their day that way. In every situation, instead of looking at the situation from the position of victory and say, I am already victorious in this. Even many believers look at every situation, every circumstance, every day as though the battle is already lost. And how can I possibly get a victory out of this? And this psalm of thanksgiving, I don't know if you've got a title over the psalm in your Bible, but that's the, the title of it in my Bible. It says a psalm of thanksgiving. And it's significant that this psalm of thanksgiving begins with a reminder of the victory that we have as children of God. Shout victoriously, he says. Because those two things can't be separated. The victory that we, that we live in, the victory that we realize that we have in life, and our thankfulness for what God has done for us, those two ideas, those two concepts cannot be separated. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, he said, Thanks be to God. Why? Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's an inseparable link between the, the thankfulness that is in our hearts and the, the, the victorious attitude that we have in our lives. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Romans chapter 8, verse 37, he said, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
We're not going to barely make it over the, the finish line. We're not going to just barely defeat those, those challenges that come up. We're not just going to barely be able to get by. We're more than conquerors. In 2 Corinthians 2.14 he said, thanks be to God who in Jesus Christ always leads us in a triumphal procession. Always leads us in a procession. I don't think this is still a cold. I think it's just because it's a little chilly. I hear everybody kind of walk around here. Everybody has the sniffles this time of year. I think we're finally over this thing, whatever this crud that we picked up along the way, but still, there's just sort of this residual stuff that's going on. We have this, this thankfulness in our lives that leads to an attitude of victorious living, a recognition of the victory that Christ has, has secured for us in our lives. I mentioned this in my devotional blog a couple of days ago, and by the way, if you haven't seen that, I share it on our Facebook page. I don't do it every day, but I do it most days. And I read the, the devotional book, Oswald Chambers' book, My Outmost for His Highest. And that blog that I write are just my thoughts, what the Lord impressed on my heart as I read that. And I share that on Facebook. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's, um, it's something that God really laid on my heart to do this year. And I can't really take credit for what I wrote a couple days ago because Oswald Chambers laid the foundation. He said something, and I was just building on what it is that he said, but this is, this is what was shared in that devotional book. He says, if we truly saw sin the way God does, now think about that for just a minute. Do you and I really look at sin in our lives the way God looks at it? Do we really have that level of hatred for sin that God has? Does it really turn our stomachs the way it turns the stomach of God? If you, you and I truly saw sin the way God does, if we really understood the destructive nature of it in our own lives and the lives of others, if we really understood and recognized the lengths that God has gone to to deal with it, it would drive a sense of thanksgiving in us for the cross that could not be shaken. We think about what, what Christ has secured for us in the cross, not just victory for eternity, that we can spend eternity in heaven, but for right now. He said, I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly right now from this moment on into eternity. Where you're having a hard time living in joy, living a victorious Christian life. If you're struggling with those issues, you find yourself in a constant sense of defeat or, or my joy is up and down or I can't seem to experience this joy that we keep talking about. And if that is you, then begin by asking yourself if you really have a thankful heart. A thankful heart for who God is and a thankful heart for what he's done. Because a thankful heart is a joyful heart. A thankful heart is a humble heart. Listen to how he goes on, verse number three. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. You know, in order to have real gratitude, in order to have a real sense of thankfulness for anything that we have in this world, in order to have that, we have to recognize something up front. And we have to recognize that we are utterly dependent on someone else. As, if you and I, as long as you and I look at the things that we have, the talents, the abilities, the, the resources, whatever. As long as you and I look at the things that we have in this world and we see only what I have done to secure them. That's all the stuff that I have. That's because of me. I earned all of that. I did all of that. This talent that I've got, I've built that up. And there's no denying the work that we put into things. But as long as we see things solely as a, as a, a result of our own, our own efforts, our own activities, as long as we see them that way, we're not truly grateful for them. We're not truly thankful for them. I did that. I earned that. And for us to really have a real gratitude, we have to recognize that we are dependent on someone else for the things that we have. And the psalmist, to, to call us to this point, he uses two different names of God there in verse 3, to remind us of who he is and remind us of our utter dependence on him. Now, Shakespeare would ask the question, what's in a name, right? But in the Hebrew culture, everything was in a name. And nowadays, parents choose names because it sounds good. I like the way this name sounds. It's kind of a cute name. I heard someone else, they named their child this, and I kind of like it. Or it's a name that's popular, something like that. Those are the reasons why we choose them now, right? That wasn't that way in Hebrew culture. In Hebrew culture, names meant something. 
That represented who you were, your character. What's in a name? Everything was in a name in the Hebrew culture. When they heard your name, they thought about who you were, your character. That's what it represented. And the way the psalmist refers to God in verse number three, he refers to him first as the Lord. Very often you'll see that in the Old Testament be all caps, the Lord. That's the Hebrew word Yahweh, the name of God, Yahweh. First time that shows up, first used by God himself. Exodus chapter three is the first time that shows up. Moses has just experienced that situation with the burning bush. God has told him that he's going to deliver his people from Egypt and he's going to use Moses as the, the point man on that job. As you can imagine, Moses is a little overwhelmed by that. He's just watched this bush that's burning. It's not been burned up. He's heard the voice of God come through it. He said he's going to do something that's just unimaginable, and Moses is going to have a big part of that. Moses is having a hard time with that, trying to have a a struggle wrapping his head around this. And Moses says, all right, God, so I'm going to go tell the children of Israel that this is what's going to happen. You're going to deliver them from Egypt. No weapons, no army, none of that stuff. You're going to deliver them from Egypt. Now, who am I to say sent me? This is where God himself uses this name. He says, you tell them I am sent you. That's that name, Yahweh. It means that the self-existent one. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, God says, he is the Alpha, the Omega, the one who was, who is, who is to come. That's the idea of Yahweh. I am. I I don't need anyone. I am. I'm not a created being. I am. I always was. I always will be. That's the name Yahweh, dependent on no one, dependent on nothing. And then he uses another name. He uses that name Yahweh. Know that the Lord Yahweh himself is God. That's the name Elohim, the most common name used in the Old Testament to to talk about God, describe God. It's used over 2,500 times. I didn't count that. I read that in the commentary. Used over 2,500 times in the Old Testament to refer to God. It refers to God as the creator, the the sustainer, the ultimate judge. Kind of refers to his role in, in things. In the beginning, God created. Elohim, that's that word. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And the psalmist says something here that, that shouldn't need to be repeated, but it often does need to be repeated. Know that the Lord himself is God, and you are not. He doesn't say that, but it's implied. God is God, and you and I are not. Now, that's something that shouldn't need to be repeated, right? But very often does need to be repeated. God, you are God, and I am not. And who am I to try to give you advice? Who am I to try to tell you how to run this universe or my life or my little slice of this thing that is going on? Who am I? To tell you, he he reminds us this of this thing that shouldn't need to be repeated, but does. God does not need us; we need Him. We add nothing to the relationship with God. He adds everything to us. Everything that we have, we owe our very existence and everything else to Him. He owes us nothing, and that's an important reminder for us when we think about our our heart of thanksgiving. To remind ourselves of just who this God is. We saw when we were looking back at at how the Bible describes the church. That that not everyone has the privilege of claiming some of the titles. The people of God, for example. the, The sheep of his pasture. Because the psalmist lays out this incredible description of who God is. Yahweh, I am, the self-existent one, the creator, sustainer, judge of all the universe. And then he gets very personal. And he says, it is he who made us and not we him, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. But not everybody has the, the ability, the right to claim those titles, the people of God. To claim that very personal connection to this incredible God. Not everybody has that privilege. Jesus said in John chapter 10 verse 27. He said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And of course he's speaking of this connection. This very intimate relationship that we know him. And that word is knowing by experience. Not just understanding and recognizing. We know him. 
he knows us. In fact, he said in Matthew chapter 7, he tells of those that will stand before him on that day. And they'll recount all the great things they did for God. Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? They'll, they'll list all these great things they did. They'll say, listen, we did these in your name. And he'll say this, depart from me. Why? I never knew you. This great and powerful, incredible, wonderful God is a relational God. He's not a transactional God. He's interested in connecting with us on a heart level, on a spiritual level. Now, here's his point. Here's the psalmist's point. That when we recognize those things about God, when we recognize who he is and realize all of that, that he is the self-existent one, that he is the creator of all things, the supreme judge over all of the universe, that we add nothing to him, but he adds everything to us. When we, when we recognize it, that despite all of that, that he has gone to great lengths to offer you and I the opportunity to have an intimate, connected, very personal relationship with him. Now listen, when we recognize all of those things, it demands humility, doesn't it? I mean, that's where he's driving. A thankful heart is a humble heart when we recognize who God is and the fact that though he didn't need to, he reached down to us. It demands humility. In fact, it dissolves pride. Where is pride in the sense of all of that? Where is there any fest, chest thumping in the face of all of that or patting ourselves on the back for what we have brought to the relationship with God? It dissolves pride. And we can be nothing but thankful to God that he not only gave us the time of day, but he gave us his most precious one, his son, so that we might be reconciled unto him. A thankful heart is not only a joyful heart, a thankful heart is a humble heart. And then the third thing I want us to see is a thankful heart is a worshipful heart. Verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, his faithfulness to all generations. Now the way he describes it, you can almost see the, the procession as a sort of making its way towards the temple. And they, they've entered the, the gates, they've entered the, his courts with thanksgiving, they've come into the sanctuary, the very presence of God. And what happens as soon as they get there? They sort of erupt in praise, right? They sort of erupt in thanksgiving, this joyful time of worship. And why not? I mean, why wouldn't they? What else would they do? You can almost picture the, the angels around the throne in Isaiah's vision. As he falls down before the throne of God and the angels are, are around the throne, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And that's what happens here. They come into the presence of God and they erupt into praise and worship. And why not? God is so good to us. And we are so undeserving of that. His, he is merciful to us sinners. He is faithful. He can be trusted throughout all generations. Why wouldn't we praise? Why wouldn't we worship? Worship is a spiritual connection, though. We often think about the things of worship, how we worship. We talk about worship in song. We talk about worship in giving. We often think about the, the methodology of worship. But worship is first and foremost a spiritual connection. Jesus said in John 4, it's done in spirit and in truth. Because listen, if worship isn't happening here, it's not happening. It's not happening anywhere. And it doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. If it's not happening here first, it's simply not happening. An unsaved person can go through all the same motions. They can come and sit in a sanctuary just like this. They can sing the songs like everyone else. They can, they can put some things in the offering plate as they go by, even open the word of God and listen. They can even amen at the appropriate points. An unsaved person can go through all the same motions, but they cannot worship in spirit and in truth, there is a connection there that happens in the moment of worship. And sin can hinder, hinder a saved person's ability to worship. You remember after his sin with Bathsheba, 
David found himself unable to even worship God. He was so burdened by the sin in his life, he couldn't even worship. Sin can do that. It can separate us and hinder our ability to worship. Real worship is a spiritual connection, and it's based on truth. It doesn't make any sense for us to worship someone that we don't know, right? It doesn't make any sense for us to try to worship someone that we have no connection to, we have no relationship with. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense for us to try to worship something or someone that is not real, that is not true. It must be based on truth. It's a spiritual connection that's based on truth. Jesus said that God's word is true, that he himself is truth, and and worship connects us to him in a very real and emotional, spiritual way. Listen, the lack of thankfulness, it draws us to sin, it draws us away from worship. We could think of the two walls of this sanctuary. One is worshiping God, drawing nearer to him. The other one is sin, and as we draw closer to sin, we naturally draw further away. Sin does that. It hinders our ability to truly worship him. And and most of our, many of our sins begin with an ungrateful heart. You think about those things that we would call minor sins. Well, in the grand scheme of things, they're not that big a deal. But we're not talking about murder here. We're not talking about theft. We're not talking about adultery, the biggies. These are tiny things that, that happen in my life. Author Jerry Bridges calls them respectable sins. Things that I'll allow to happen. I'll notice them in other people, but I'll let them happen in my own life. Sins like complaining or idolatry or pride, impatience, sins of the tongue, lack of self-control. Those things that will allow to creep in. And where do those begin? Every one of them begins with a heart that is ungrateful. It's how Satan opened the door to sin in the Garden of Eden. That first sin that he introduced was the sin of doubt. Did God really say, oh, you can't trust God? That was the the seed that he planted. He's not good to you. He's not looking out for your your best interest. He's holding out on you. That's the sin of doubt. Those sins begin with a heart that is ungrateful towards God, that doesn't recognize what he has done for us and can only see the one thing that we think he should. When we renew our minds with the truth, We go back and remember who this God is, all of those things that the psalmist talked about. And we go back and renew our minds with the truth. We can't help but to be thankful. We can't help but to have a heart that is filled with gratitude. That draws us to worship him. Just like them, as we enter his presence, we can't help but to burst out in praise and worship. January 2013... Greater Good Magazine commissioned a study called How Grateful Are Americans? And this is what they found, that over 90% of those who responded said that parents should teach gratitude to their children. That was, that was encouraging to read that, that across American society, 90% felt that way. Over 90% said that, that gratitude is a key factor in success in life. And 95% said that grateful people are more fulfilled and lead richer lives. But they also found this, that though that many people recognize the importance of gratitude, recognize the importance of thankfulness in our lives, they found this, 19% said that they think that they see regular expressions of gratitude or thanksgiving. Only 19%. This is such an important thing. Over 90% said this is important. We ought to teach it to our kids. We ought to live lives, the impact that it has on us, but less than 20% said I actually see it happening. And that's because true gratitude can't be manufactured. It's not something we can fake. It's not something that we can just will ourselves to have. True thankfulness, true gratitude cannot be manufactured. It's a heart attitude that flows from recognizing who God is, recognizing what he has done for us. True gratitude drives joy. It drives a sense of victory. It defeats pride in our lives. It enables worship. Let me just wrap it up this way this morning. If those things are lacking in your life, joy, victory, if pride is overwhelmed, if the defeat of pride is lacking in your life, if worship is lacking in your life, if those things are lacking, begin by evaluating your heart of thankfulness. 
Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we realize that thank you is simply not enough. Simply not enough just to come before you and, and say those words. You desire so much that we would have a, a heart that recognizes who you are. It's such an important part of our lives, your very will for us that we would be thankful in all circumstances. Because you are great, because you are good to us. Father, forgive us for the often lack of gratefulness that we have. Lack of acknowledgement of your goodness to us. Fathers, we're going to enter these moments of invitation here in just a few minutes. Father, I realize there might be one here this morning. They cannot really experience thankfulness to you. Cannot ex really experience this heart of gratefulness because they don't know you. And Father, as your spirit has spoke to our hearts this morning, Lord, I pray that as we enter this time of invitation, Lord, that you would just draw that one to you. They would not only see it, not just acknowledge it with their heads, but they would acknowledge it with their hearts, the, the lengths that you have gone to to defeat sin for them. Give them the boldness to step out and just say, I need to know Jesus. And Father, for your children here, sometimes we, we lose sight of who you are and what you've done. We get wrapped up in just seeing what we want rather than what we have. Father, let this be a time of repentance, a time of restoration, just to lay those sins down at your feet. Lord, as you continue to move in these next few moments, Father, would you help us to respond to your spirit? We pray in Jesus' name. Well, stand with us as we sing our hymn of invitation. If, if there is a decision...